So hello everyone, uh, my name is Marcin, this is Michal, and uh, today we will talk to you on behalf of the entire consortium about the architecture of OGC services deployment on Kubernetes cluster based on Creodia's cloud computing platform. So a few words about us. We work at Cloudfero at uh, data science department. As you can see, we are uh, diehard users of Phosphor-G and because of the uh, nature of our company, who se uh, which serves as a storage for Copernicus program, we focus mainly on rasters and we are trying to implement this uh, amazing Phosphor-G on, uh, on our repository and on our infrastructure. So the ecosystem idea, in my personal opinion, it's kind of a system of connected vessels where uh, the, by initiative of ESA, the biggest players when it comes to spatial data gathered uh, and created complementary solutions. So there is no one solution. There is many solutions uh, which, um, so the user can uh, select which one uh, fits uh, better for them. So it's amazing, um, and yeah, and as you can see, there's a Cloudfero as an infrastructure and storage provider. There is Synergize as a provider of uh, uh, processing services. Also, there's the systems, uh, which provides also the cloud infrastructure, and many more. So in this uh, work, ecosystem has uh, four roles. First of all, the cloud environment. You've got to do these things somewhere. Uh, another aspect is the S3 mounted uh, data repository and now it's almost 80 petabytes of data in immediate access uh, with uh, various types of access for both commercial and non-commercial users. For example, if you are a non-commercial user, you can download the data, you can access the data through uh, API uh, and yeah, for example, using the Jupyter Notebook or various types of graphic uh, interfaces. If you are a commercial user, the data is already on your machine mounted via S3. So after running the machine, there is this uh, folder called EODATA, and within uh, it, there is almost 80 petabytes of data. And if we are discussing the volume of this size, We've got to have some uh, dedicated tools which enable the efficient data discovery and access. Uh, so it, this is the APIs and the graphical uh, user interface uh, yeah, in front of these APIs. And also, we've got to do something with the data. We are providing our users with the uh, tools in form of, for example, OpenEO or Jupyter Notebooks or um, Open Phosphor-G on their uh, machines so they can process the data. This is the example of uh, running the infrastructure for a non-commercial user. After logging on CDSC website, you can uh, run Jupyter Notebook, you can select the size of it and select the kernel ranging from the clear Python tree to Python with uh, geoscience libraries like GeoPandas and stuff, uh, OpenEO, or recently added uh, R kernels. And if uh, and this is work uh, this work based on the predefined quota limits. So so yeah, which resets every month. And if the quota limits provided by us for you is not enough, then you should really consider. Uh, requesting for a higher tier accounts. So if you work on a public institution or scientific institution, you can elevate your quota levels up to the Copernicus services provider uh, level. So this is uh, like crazy amount of uh, computing power totally for free and it resets every month. And if you want to do this, please, uh, oh, that's, the, that's it. Please uh, visit this link. It's very well described how to do this. And yeah, today we will dis discuss the Creodias implementation. Uh, this is all of, uh, I told this is, everything is great, but if you would like to run some clusters, you would like to run actual virtual machines, or you would like to expose your services, then you should try out the uh, commercial aspect. Uh, the Creodias is uh, the product of the entire consortium, but it started uh, at Cloudfero and uh, based on the um, really easy graphical user interface, you are um, 
you can just run through it and uh, provide information starting from basics like virtual machine name, uh, then select the size of machine, then select the flavor. Uh, yes, the flavor is the actual size, then select the image which uh, describes what uh, operating system, but not only. For example, one of the images is the OSG Live 16. So it's really nice because you can uh, jump into known environment and start uh, yeah, your computation and work. And yeah, this is, like I said, this is a really easy process. The startup time of the machine it uh, took uh, usually less than 60 seconds. So why OGC services? This one is really uh, easy to answer because it's popular, uh, everyone uses it. Uh, it's uh, official standards, so this is very important for public institutions. Uh, yeah, it works with almost uh, with all types of uh, spatial data formats. And the output of OGC services can be then uh, further processed via every GIS network uh, framework, starting from QGIS, uh, to GDAL and to PostGIS, yeah. So as a, let's get technical, so as a um, framework which is realizing the OGC uh, standards, we select Map Server because it's C-based, so it's fast, uh, the C software. Uh, so it, it works like this, uh, the happy user sends get map request, uh, it hits the map server instance and then map server checks the map file configuration and map file is the head of map server, it stores the information on uh, hey, what data the user wants and how you should render this data. Uh, based on this, map server reaches out to spatial data um, formats supported, as you can see, uh, there are Postgres, uh, GeoPackage, COGs, which are my dream that every uh, data would be stored in COGs, but unfortunately it's not, and the JPEG 2000. Then it renders back the data to the user and user gets the um, just visualization of data or the analytical uh, value data, if we are discussing the WCS. And another advantage of uh, Map Server is that it's uh, GDAL based. Uh, and uh, GDAL is my favorite uh, geospatial software. Uh, and we are using very, two very cool uh, functions of GDAL. So, first of all, the uh, VRT, virtual rasters. You are uh, able to provide the GDAL with instruction on how, to, how it should process the data, and it happens on the fly. Uh, so Mm, example, we are using it to, uh, for uh, on-the-fly cloud masking for Sentinel-2. Uh, in Sentinel-2, there is uh, this file called uh, SLC, which uh, represents the scene classification map. Uh, and we can just provide GDAL with it, uh, the virtual raster with it, and it will, uh, yeah, it, and it will mask, the, mask uh, the cloud out. So if you are requesting the data from more than one day, the cloudless uh, mosaic will be created. Yeah, that's it. And the, there's another great uh, uh, utility of GDAL, which is called virtual storage systems. For example, it, uh, this works as a prefix to the actual path of, uh, for, for the data. Uh, for example, if the data is uh, in, stored in zipped archive, you can use it to extract the data out of zip without uh, actually um, unpacking the zip folder. We are using it to uh, reach out the data stored on S3. And if you have ever used the Creodias, the, there is this, uh, like I said, there's this folder EODATA, and in fact, it's a massive S3 bucket. So with this prefix, we are able to reach to the remotely to all of the data gathered by Copernicus program, and not only, uh, and yeah, and provide with some custom instruction on how uh, GDAL, uh, or, map ser or rather map server using GDAL should process it. And yeah, uh, another uh, nice uh, place where we use the GDAL. Uh, if you ever use the Copernicus browser, which works really nice and it's amazing too, but if you zoom out uh, too much, uh, you should be 
uh, greeted with the information that the, da the data will be displayed if you zoom in. We are trying not to do this here in, in this solution. So what we do is uh, creating daily overviews for, uh, for, for now for the Europe. So, um, uh, so the actual data uh, from your data is requested uh, only af uh, after the um, daily overviews in form of COG. From the user perspective, it uh, does not uh, have any, um, yeah, any, any the users have no any problems with it because the overview is on, only on uh, low zoom levels and there is no difference between this and uh, the original data, but there is a difference in the rendering time. And uh, we are using the amazing um, function option of GDAL, which is called sparse oc true. So the non-value non data is actually not transferred to the existing file. Thanks to this, the files are really small, so there is no problem with the um, storage. And yeah, let's discuss the map file, uh, the heart of map server, the instruction on how to render the data. Um, in my dream scenario, I love uh, the idea of having all of the data in uh, cloud-optimized geotiffs. But uh, so it has this, I'm sure you're familiar with the internal structures of overviews and tiling, and this would be amazing, but unfortunately this is not true. Uh, we are storing the data in JPEG 2000, but uh, the Sentinel-2 L2A uh, have these um, directories uh, representing the um, different spatial resolutions of uh, rasters, and you can use it to create your own pyramid uh, within the uh, map file. So using the layer definition, I can first uh, reach out to 60 meters, then to 12, 20 meters, and the best resolution in form of 10 meters is, uh, is displayed only on uh, yeah, high, zoom level, high zoom levels. So this is great, and thanks to this, we can uh, make the uh, service work very fast. Yeah, another uh, nice utility of map server is the tile indexing. So, uh, because we are talking about for Sentinel-2, it's almost 40 petabytes of data, I think. So we cannot store it just in form of paths to in a text file. This is not readable by any uh, software, I guess. But we can store it in Postgres, and we can define the connection from map server to Postgres. So um, the data actually is stored in the, the paths to the data is stored in the table uh, with uh, at least three columns. So the location, path to S3, uh, the date time, so, so the time type of the data, and the geometry, which is uh, the footprint of the actual photo. So if you are familiar with uh, the, for example, get map request, it can um, provide the service with information about boundary box of the requested data, and the boundary box is then transferred to the SQL query and only um, intersecting polygons, well, rasters are, uh, are chosen. So yeah, that's great. And uh, this is, one more time, that this is uh, the table which represents the uh, spatio-temporal index for, of the rasters. So this is pre pretty much the uh, stack, which stands for spatio-temporal asset catalog. And we are using the, um, the back, as a backend of the tile index, we are using the PG stack. So um, it's just a Postgres table. And thanks to the map server SQL query, we can uh, yeah, mm, transform the table to uh, PG stack table to the table which is recognizable by uh, map server. So thanks to this, we are loading stack with uh, Sentinel-2 items. And uh, in the same time, we are creating the WMS service out of it because then the query stays the, the same, or the table is growing, and, uh, and yeah, and the, the stack has this amazing uh, stack extension called WebMap Links, and it gives possibility of also uh, adding the 
um, adding the uh, services uh, URLs to the stack items. Uh, so yeah, so also the stack items associated with OGC services, which is, in my opinion, great. And um, the whole magic here is in writing the correct SQL query. So yeah, the Kubernetes deployment. Uh, we are, as I said, we use the Creodias dashboard to deploy the Kubernetes cluster, which is super easy. And uh, the idea is here that we wanted to be protected from potential bottlenecks in form of, uh, yeah, in form of map server not being able to uh, sc scale up enough. So there is uh, many pods, uh, workers deployed on the Kubernetes cluster, and in front of them there's load balancer. So if there is uh, many users, uh, the, every request is uh, aimed to other pod. So uh, there is no problem on the side of uh, yeah of the map server efficiency. Okay, so one more thing about uh, why we're using GDAL. And um, they, as Martin uh, said before, we're working on a cloudless mosaic of Sentinel 2 images. But we're, the big thing is we're not creating new images. We're using one, the same data set. And it's all defined inside this uh, VRT file, which is something like XML. And we define there that some pixels are cloud, some are not, and those that uh, are cloud should be transparent. But we're, again, uh, we're not creating new images, new data. Uh, and if we wanted to, like, for example, create a mosa mosaic of NDVI or NWEI, uh, we would just create a, a new definition inside those XMLs. So we, there's no big storage behind this. We define how data should be uh, just visualized. And the final step in our pipeline, uh, in our solution, is QGIS plugin, which will be something between user and our OGS, OGC services. And um, its meant, main goal of this plugin is to provide an easy tool that will handle all the request, uh, request and uh, give uh, users um, easy visualization and easy access to data through uh, WCS and WMS. And uh, here you can see uh, how it looks like in uh, plugin. Uh, you can visualize data uh, just, uh, just via uh, choosing uh, date time. Uh, and you can, hitting one button, you can add a uh, whole data set, a uh, new layer to QGIS that will uh, correspond that will, will be uh, for example one month one week uh, of uh, data and also there's uh, as i said there's download uh, via wcs where you just uh, like in wms scenario you just define uh, a time here you can you must uh, define also area of interest when you just drive uh, uh, drive B-Box uh, in G uh, QGIS and you hit download button and you will get a GeoTIFF where with maximum resolution 10 meter on 10 meter and uh, you can just process on your machine as you like. And, uh, oh, sorry. And, okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, what we are missing right now it's, uh, yeah, we should really consider moving to OGC APIs since the old standards have right now, I don't know, like 20 years. Uh, so yeah, and PyGeo API seems promising here. Uh, another thing is that we should rebuild our uh, QGIS plugin, the demo of it. So it uses stack, and here it will use the stack for search and download of original data, so the data discovery download of uh, separate products and the assets and uh, single assets uh, within products should be based on stack. The visualization should be based on WMS or, or and uh, OGC maps. And the analytics should be based on WCS OG, or, and OGC coverages. Um, and yeah, regarding the processing, 
uh, yeah, we are about to add the possibility of creating your own band composition uh, using the URL. Uh, also, we want to provide users with uh, utility of writing their own script. So, for example, you can you would like to create uh, the script which takes only uh, yeah, which scales the raster by minimum value, uh, and you can do it in Python or C, and we will implement for it it for you, and it also will be possible through the yeah, I guess some kind of URL. We are not. Uh, this is not actually figured out yet. Uh, and yeah, custom index computation. And it's also on the table. It's, we are pretty ready to go with it. Another aspect is that because we are, uh, the PG stack is great and I love it uh, with all my health. But uh, currently we are running it on a single um, Docker container. And uh, if we are aiming to, um, create the, the whole catalog out of it. We should deploy it the cloud native way. And here, uh, the EO API uh, has the is about to release the crunchy data Postgres operator for Kubernetes, and this seems really promising. If not, we will probably go with uh, our own implementation in form of based on uh, cloud native PG operator. And then it would be super easy because uh, then you can use the PyPG stack to, yeah, to start the PG stack on the selected, uh, selected database. All you need is the credential of the database. And yeah, the uh, whole idea of the replication of the whole catalog in stack will be based, uh, will be more, um, it will be easier if uh, after the ISA transition to GeoSR format which supports the internal overviews and the internal structure of tiling. And yeah, it's, it's great for analytics thanks to its yeah, being native to data cubes. And authentication of users uh, using the S3 create that out of uh, the CDSE. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Machin and Michal. It's always nice to hear so many uh, enthusiastic speakers. Uh, I'll start out with, since I know the rest of your slides, I'll start out with the first question. Do you have any input on the future to the, to the system? Maybe you have an extra slide you could show us with the future. Yes, so yes. that's my question. Do you yes, have something about the, ah, great. There's the future slide. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, so yeah, it's maybe I will answer if just discussing the slide. So uh, we, uh, starting from the beginning, we will extract the metadata using the stack tools uh, or our own tool uh, based on the actual metadata stored uh, in uh, the repository with associated safe catalogs. Then we will load this JSON to PG stack and the PG stack will serve as a tile index for both map server and uh, PyGeo API, which uses the map script. And then we will use the uh, GDAL uh, VRT to provide this analytical value, the processing on the fly uh, for WMS T, WCS, OGC maps, and OGC coverages. Uh, and this will, uh, yeah, this will uh, do its work uh, on the QGIS plugin, um, as well as the Stackfast API. So, so yeah, that's it. That's the future, and uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to present it on, on the next Phosphor G. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you're using uh, JPEG 2000 right now, and in a perfect world, uh, it would be cloud-optimized GeoTIFF. And now I also saw GeoSA. Uh, could you elaborate on, on benefits or like downsides of, of the different formats? Okay, so uh, the main difference between the uh, COG and JPEG 2000 is that the COG has this internal structures overviews and tiling. So uh, if user want to, for example, get the data over Tartu from Sentinel-2 photo, uh, the map server reads only the, this little part of tile. In case of JPEG 2000, they 
whole uh, set of overviews must be uh, must be read to get the the only uh, the actual data. So that's the that's the main uh, that's the that's the main difference. But hey, the JPEG 2000 has uh, better compression from what I understand. Plus uh, the GeoZar, the GeoZar. I'm not an expert on the GeoZar, but uh, I know that it has amazing analytical value because it's a Mm, format native to the data cubes, so that's it. And in the same time, it also supports the internal uh, structure of uh, tiling and overviews. So that's kind of supreme format when it comes to data streaming and uh, data analytics. And, and that, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. Also, I want to add that uh, element 84, if you know the, them. Uh, providing cloud optimized GTFs with stack uh, up to date uh, for Sentinel 2. So you can use them directly from S3, public S3 buckets. Uh, from uh, Element 84. Open data sets from AWS, you can use the okay, Sentinel. But, but here's the thing we are at the, at the the CDAC and company I represent is uh, the official storage of, uh, of <coughs> sorry, of Copernicus program. So okay. I guess that's not a good idea to get the data, we, the original data that we have from other providers. So yeah, but thank you for your question. 